Uh, there's another source that said that uh, this was a filmed event, which leads you to believe that it was set up prearranged in advance to have the cameras all locked and loaded and ready to go uh, to record Eisenhower meeting with these beings. Now we could be kind of shallow and say, well, that was for political reasons. Should the um, meeting be leaked? Eisenhower could say, yes, I'm the man who met with these friendly human beings from another world. He could use it as a, a political campaign to get reelected and say, look who chose to came, come down and, and meet with uh, the first US president. Well, that would be me. Uh, or he was there to record it in case something went wrong. That I'm sure there was the worry that these could have been a, a Trojan horse type affair where they appear to be friendly at first. And then what if they whipped out some weapons or had superpowers that we weren't aware of and uh, they were worried that something would go wrong and they wanted to record this for posterity in case the president was killed or abducted or something. But nothing like that happened at all. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Paul Blake Smith to Exopolitics today. He's the author of President Eisenhower's Close Encounters, a really well-researched, meticulously investigated book that was published in 2020 by Paul and I want to welcome you to the show Paul and uh, introduce you and your book to my audience. Well I thank you for having me on Michael. Uh, I've read your work for so many years and admire your own research so this is a good match here today. Uh, as you mentioned I try to put as much research into my book as I can and I think I created a mountain of circumstantial evidence that could convince a jury, uh, the book reading public, uh, that this really did happen, that President Eisenhower really did meet with some friendly human-like aliens in 1954. And there might have been two other uh, instances, as the book points out. So uh, I heard this story uh, in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, I started to think, uh, maybe I could put together a book on this and did more research and then put it aside. And then 10 years later, I did the same thing. And finally, uh, in uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19, I began to get more earnest and, and dig into this more completely. And it was uh, accepted and published by uh, foundationsbooks.net. And it's done quite well. They consider it a bestseller. And we got a lot of good reviews. And I'm grateful. Uh, we've got the interest of uh, a couple of... Uh, television producer people. We'll see if something can get to the small screen in the coming uh, year or two. Uh, these things take time. If I had my way, all of this would be right now. But, uh, you know, that's showbiz. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I know you actually were born and raised in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which uh, in itself is very notable because that is the first uh, UFO crash uh, operation that has been kind of like leaked into the general public and actually invested that investigated that case that that occurred in 1941 and it's being mentioned in a few of these limits so why don't you tell the audience what you know about 1941 cape Girardeau your crash i began to hear the story uh, around the year 2000 and uh, i asked my dad who was a five-year-old in Cape Girardeau at the time, and my grandfather was a judge in Cape Girardeau. Uh, he had been passed on for some years, and my dad said, I'm not familiar with this case, but I am familiar with almost all the people mentioned in the case. And uh, it could be true because way back in the 40s and even the 50s and early 60s, you did what your government told you. You were compliant. You didn't protest. You didn't uh, rebel, really. And if they told you to keep quiet, you surely would have. Cape Girardeau was a very conservative town, uh, a church-going Christian community of about 20,000 people on the banks of the Mississippi in 1941. When I was growing up there, and to this day, it's a little closer to 40,000, but it's still a, a largely conservative community. This is Rush Limbaugh, the broadcaster's hometown. 
when I was a boy, Rush was an obscure um, radio DJ, and he picked up extra dollars by uh, acting as an umpire at baseball games in the park. And I had him as my umpire as a little boy. Uh, he was a pretty big guy even then, physically, uh, kind of imposing. But uh, I can't say that I knew him. My dad knew Rush Limbaugh's father, and my grandfather was pretty good friends with Rush Limbaugh, the broadcaster's grandfather. Uh, all of these people are now passed away. And this is a problem I found in trying to research the Cape Girardeau story. Everyone's passed away, and in many cases, their children are passed away. It happened so long ago. Uh, about 81 years ago now. <clears throat> and it's very difficult when people were sworn to secrecy and then they died off. <laughs> so this really uh, is a fascinating case that uh, a spaceship from another planet or dimension crashed in a farm field outside of town. And that three uh, typical gray alien bodies were pulled out of it. One barely still alive, but uncommunicative and uh, that the, the townspeople came out, including the fire department, because there was a blaze all around it. And uh, in later years, uh, as the story broke around 2000, one of the Cape Girardeau firemen apparently uh, was ill with cancer and he gathered his family around him and said, you know this story about a UFO crash? Well, the whole thing is true. He said, I was there. I was helping the fire department fight the fire. That was my job. Uh, it set the, uh, the, the field on fire around the crashed disc and that uh, he saw the bodies. And just as everyone was uh, getting a pretty good look, even though things were dark, I'm sure they were using uh, lamps and, uh, you know, uh, lanterns rather, or headlights from cars or flashlights, whatever they could use to light up the scene as the fire died down. Uh, he, he saw inside the craft, apparently, and he saw the bodies. But the military moved in, and you're thinking, how could the military have just pulled right in? Uh, there was no great military base anywhere around Cape Girardeau. Well, yes and no. First, Cape Girardeau was a, um, a National Guard armory uh, site that uh, a young man named Harry Truman uh, lived in Cape Girardeau in 1906 and uh, trained in the National Guard Army right there in Cape. Uh, so that was many years before the crash, but also uh, it was ongoing at the time. So many citizens were like citizen soldiers or part of the National Guard. And uh, there was another factor. You didn't want to talk because your neighbor could have been uh, someone who could have squealed on you being part of the military presence. Another factor was there was an aerial training program uh, in Sykeston at their airport run by the military, the Army Air Corps. And the head of that, uh, one of the executives who ran it, not quite the, the chief, uh, was named Ben Shoddy, and that his brother was the Cape Girardeau County Sheriff, who was apparently seen at the scene of the crash. So all it took was one phone call uh, to this Sykeston unit about 35 miles south of the crash. They gathered uh, some uh, Air Force or Air Corps pilots and soldiers and uh, maybe a few executives with the uh, training program, hopped in a truck or two and drove right up to the site and hemmed it in and said, this did not happen. You did not see this. This is a matter of national security. Uh, put back all that debris, uh, no notes, no photos. Uh, this uh, is something you will never talk about for the rest of your life. And even an FBI man was there swearing people to secrecy. And when I read these uh, first accounts that surfaced around 2000, I thought at first, oh, there's no FBI office in my hometown of Cape back in 1941. But as I began to research it, uh, it's amazing. In early March, an FBI office opened up in the Cape Girardeau uh, post office upstairs due to German uh, pro-Hitler uh, sabotage going on in the area. So there was a great worry about uh, Nazi spies and saboteurs, and they obviously didn't want anyone right from the minute of the crash to find out about this bizarre recovery of a disc and three small little spacemen is what they were calling it back then. They didn't say aliens or extraterrestrials. They said little men from space is what I'm told. And they uh, crashed in a spaceship. Well, uh, the FBI probably 
sternly warned them, swore them, maybe even on a Bible, and people took this seriously. And so it was so tough to get any information decades later. My stepmother told me she heard the story back in the 1960s when she was going to high school. Someone called Rush Limbaugh's radio program around 2006 or seven and said, Rush, what's up with this spaceship crash in your own hometown? And he did not dismiss the caller and tell him, get out of here. I don't want to hear this nonsense. That's a bunch of lies. He said, there's more to this story than you might think. And then he moved on to the next caller. So he had a chance to dismiss or, you know, uh, just tamp down the whole thing. And he did not. He had a conservative audience and he didn't want to talk about it. But he, you got the impression that uh, he learned about it probably from his father, who was an Air Corps pilot in World War II and Korea. He was a very brave uh, war hero, really. Rush Limbaugh II. Rush the broadcaster was Rush the Third. So uh, Rush's grandfather was a very well-known, very esteemed, reputable gentleman in town, a Freemason. And so was Harry Truman, who was the uh, US Senator from Missouri at the time of the crash. In fact, Harry was the Grand Master Freemason of the state of Missouri. So uh, there's nothing wrong with being a Mason. They're a very noble group, I wanna emphasize. But they keep certain secrets. They got even certain uh, secret languages and handshakes and secretive meetings, and they don't tell you what's going on. So this is another factor that kept the story secret. And they didn't let it out. Uh, I'm sure almost all of the people there, but uh, a Christian pastor who showed up uh, went home pale and shaken, and his family was deeply worried that night. And uh, they said, where have you been? What's going on? And he broke down and told them that there was a, a round gray metal disc that crashed with this cracked open area. He said, I peeked into it and there was a seat and, and some dials and gauges have a, like a dashboard, a little seat about the size of a, a child would use. And he said there were these small alien beings about four foot tall at most, gray and kind of rubbery with wrinkled skin or a flight suit. It was difficult to tell in the dark. Uh, it might have been a combination of both that sort of melded together in our oxygen-rich atmosphere here on Earth. They weren't accustomed to being outside their cockpit, and they apparently asphyxiated because they had no visible injuries whatsoever. They were all identical, and uh, it was as if they were punched out of a, a mold or in a factory. And it's interesting to note that uh, Philip Corso said his information was that these grays were considered uh, by American scientists to be bio robots that were indeed cloned or grown in a laboratory and trained, uh, in almost uh, difficult to put, but they were like slaves to higher intelligence. They did their dirty work. They scouted uh, planet Earth and report back on what they found. So this makes sense in this Cape Girardeau case and why aliens did not come back for the crash of the bodies. Like, oh, we get plenty more of that back at the factory or the laboratory. Uh, that is speculation, but I think it fits. So the military <laughs> took off with all of that, and it was never seen in Cape Girardeau again. <laughs> well, the, I mean, you mentioned the secrecy that was in existence in World War II, and uh, it's something that we really need to kind of like emphasize because that really was the big thing during that era. It was, as you said, it was a very different time, and and people took secrecy very seriously. And uh, you mentioned in the book that uh, there was an agreement between Winston Churchill and President Eisenhower over the UFO topic, and that Churchill wanted to keep it secret for 50 years, and Eisenhower agreed. So, you know, what do you recall about that particular incident? Uh, this came out uh, like 10 years ago, that uh, a bodyguard to Winston Churchill, who was part of the British um, uh, Royal Air Force, the RAF, said he overheard Winston Churchill and Dwight Eisenhower, uh, commanding general of all allied forces in Europe, talking about this strange disc craft, this metal craft that was uh, flying around uh, over the English Channel near an RAF plane. And they debated what to do and said, you know, this really needs to be kept secret. According to the bodyguard, they said uh, they were worried that this would cause people to possibly panic, but certainly uh, give up their faith and their Christian religion, which was huge back then. 
Uh, and so they decided, uh, Churchill especially, to bury the story that it's best that people don't know. And in Cape Girardeau, again, the same story back in the 40s in my first book, uh, that uh, it was best that uh, you just do what you're told. And this is not a Christian kind of uh, theme story that aliens from another world, a lot of people don't believe in that. And so uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, this was a huge factor when he became president in 53, uh, within a month or so of being uh, inaugurated, President Eisenhower is the only US president to have himself baptized. He wanted to re-emphasize his strong conservative Christian values. So he wasn't the most open-minded guy when it came to uh, contact and disclosure and the idea that we're going to educate the people of planet Earth on something that might have taken away people's faith in uh, uh, Jesus Christ or in God in particular. Uh, he also had to worry, uh, Eisenhower did, during World War II and uh, hearing these um, Foo Fighter reports in Europe of uh, discs and orbs and uh, strange craft that the, the RAF and American flyers were reported seeing uh, to keep this kind of tamped down that uh, he didn't want to start any social disorder or any questions that America and the allies were not in charge of our skies. So there was another factor, wartime secrecy. Eisenhower was a military man. And their motto, as you know, is loose lips sink ships. So it was kept buttoned up, uh, all of this in the 40s and 50s, probably still is to this day, but that was the mindset. We were much more a military-minded uh, country due to World War II, the Korean War, the Cold War. And by the time Eisenhower took office, uh, he instituted a policy of secrecy that you read in the book. I try not to go into great detail because uh, uh, all of the rules and regulations within this military stipulation that people in the military would not talk about UFOs. And then they uh, created a, a kind of a Southern California meeting for uh, airline pilots and asked them, don't talk about UFOs, keep it to yourself. So again, we're just thwarted here uh, 50, 60, 70 years later and trying to get to the truth. So many people were muzzled. So one of the key questions that arises here then is, well, exactly what were they keeping secret? What was it that Eisenhower and Churchill wanted to keep secret from the world? Was it the fact that these UFOs were real? Was it that uh, the UFOs were extraterrestrial in origin? Or possibly were they German flying saucer craft that a lot of people have <laughs> said actually were being uh, tested at the time? Yeah, that's probably another factor at the time. They didn't know. Is this a uh, Hitler secret uh, war machine? Is this a German um, flying craft? Or is this from another world? Either way, they didn't like the answer. And they felt like this is gonna cause quite an uproar. We don't need any headaches in World War II. Just keep it all secret. Don't talk about it. So uh, it was understandable then we're trying to win a war. And Eisenhower and Churchill were uh, very good friends. They were both conservatives. And uh, they both uh, relied on each other for coordinating and communicating to defeat the Nazi war machine in the uh, mid-1940s. And when that did happen, both became immensely popular and were voted into office uh, uh, in the years to come. They were hailed as national heroes. And conservative national heroes are not going to be talking about uh, secret uh, flying machines, whether they're from uh, Hitler's war arsenal or from another world. So uh, we're butting heads up against uh, that secrecy, files destroyed, I'm sure, film footage or photos taken at the time. There's very little that has leaked out in that period. Uh, Eisenhower was a good man and a loyal American. We could be very proud of him, very glad he was on our side, uh, but his policy was uh, very military uh, to uh, keep things hushed up. Now, in your book, you, you put a lot of emphasis on a leaked Defense Intelligence Agency document from 1989. Uh, that's allegedly when it was uh, put together. It's 47 pages, and it was leaked by uh, Heather Wade, a radio broadcaster, in, in, June 20, in June of 2017. And that document talks about the 1948 Aztec UFO crash 
and the survival of an extraterrestrial entity, uh, Sedimus, and three infants. So that's an important document that you look at throughout the book. Now, the key question here is, well, why do you believe it's authentic? Um, I have only a couple of reservations with this document. Overall, I think it's a, a factual one. There's a few misspellings. But in my research of government documents, I find misspellings all the time. Uh, President Eisenhower's uh, daily schedule had his secretary uh, type up and make mistakes, and it's part of his uh, digitized records to this day. One example is that he went golfing at the Thunderbolt Golf Club in Palm Springs. Well, it was the Thunderbird. They couldn't even get that straight. So there's a few mistakes, like it says uh, an Air Force base. Uh, that was actually in New Mexico. They accidentally uh, put it in uh, Texas. Uh, and so any first draft or even a second draft, if you don't know you're making a mistake, a mistake might be left in. I don't have a big problem with that. It is a very complex, detailed document that tells you uh, tremendous, fascinating details of the Aztec crash. And before we go any further, we must admit that um, there was a UFO investigator back then who tried to piece together the story and he was purposely fed misinformation and that mucked up and made a bit of a mess of that tale at the time. The uh, government apparently were behind, was behind this in America to discredit the story. But the more you read about it, and I put in uh, a couple sources in my book that uh, seem credible in talking about it uh, and more detail and more believability that we can accept something like this happened in New Mexico in 48, that uh, I think the documents are factual. Uh, there's one uh, UFO researcher that said, well, my expert didn't like the cover page uh, that says above top secret. And I'm thinking, that's it? That's the only reason you're dismissing this whole leaked document from 1989? I don't find that acceptable. Even the source who said this said, oh, the information in the report could all be quite true. But I don't like that cover page. Well, that's just dumb. But uh, anyway, I think it is uh, believable. And it does say within its pages that Eisenhower did have three meetings with friendly human-like extraterrestrials and came to an agreement with them that we might be adhering to to this day. Uh, the document is reprinted in the back of my book. Uh, my copy, uh, early copy, and it might be to this day, is missing the conclusion, the last eight or nine pages. And this is unfortunate. However, I'm working on a brand new book. Uh, it's just finished uh, called The Nixon Gleason Alien Encounter, in which uh, I'll need those last eight or nine pages to put in the back of that book as a, a kind of fitting sequel. And so uh, overall, I put some stock into it. I think it could be uh, largely true or entirely true. It's from the Defense Intelligence Agency as a briefing document, apparently for the new George H.W. Bush administration in early January 1989, when they came into office uh, a few days later uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan on his way out. Uh, it's interesting to know that uh, Mr. Bush highly trusted individual, eight years as vice president and a few years as CIA director. So they probably would have told him plenty and he would have farmed out the report to anyone he felt had a need to know basis and would have been trusted with the information. Uh, I think that the 48 crash probably did occur. I've read more about it. I'm not the leading expert, but it, uh, according to the document, a, a silver disc uh, came down to earth, and it wasn't much of a crash, frankly. It uh, nudged up against a stone canyon wall uh, outside of Aztec, New Mexico, and that was enough to disable the craft from flying, and yet it still had power. Uh, when uh, American forces moved in, they found uh, a number of dead bodies. Apparently, uh, they didn't survive uh, perhaps a lack of oxygen or a lack of a functioning cockpit. And there were some uh, other bodies that were in a sleep state. And if you read more of the document, you find out our scientists blundered right in and tried to crack open the sleep state uh, pods to uh, rescue the alien creatures or beings that were asleep and they botched it badly and had only one survivor. And uh, they tried their best to come up 
and spell his name. Sedimus is the one I use. There was a couple other versions of this uh, alien. And he was human-like, uh, very uh, human and friendly and warm and kind. And they began to trust him. And he began to relay information that is included in the document. I'm sure there was plenty more information that was not included in it. So uh, this story becomes more significant when we go along and find out that Eisenhower met with the same sounding uh, description of alien beings. They were human-like. Um, and before I go any further, I should point out that um, recently online, there have been some stories from scientists who are speculating through uh, facts and what we know about the cosmos that there are other Earth-like planets in the known universe, and there are other beings very much like human beings. They think human beings or homo sapiens are growing, living, thriving on many other planets, could be millions of human-like beings. So this re-emphasizes what came down in 1954 uh, for President Eisenhower and what may have originally come down uh, outside of Aztec, New Mexico in March of 1948. Yeah, I, I want to just uh, emphasize that that uh, leaked 1989 document, I, I think, is authentic. I actually did some work with uh, Dr. Robert Wood. I know you know him well as well. And he, uh, to the best of his abilities, authenticated it as, as genuine. So it is a very important document, and it has been ignored by a lot of UFO researchers. Yeah. So I'm very glad that you've um, identified its importance and and I frankly didn't I didn't realize when I first read it I didn't realize the significance and that's what I appreciated about your book as you pointed out some of the significance of this document in terms of things like uh, the this extraterrestrial the the adult uh, Sedimus spent a year basically under protective custody and meeting with uh, President Truman and other senior officials and that's very important for understanding Eisenhower's role in all of this, because you, you believe that uh, Eisenhower, and I think for good reason, uh, actually did meet with Sedimus sometime in that 1948-49 period, and that kind of laid the foundations for what happened later. So why don't you walk us through, you know, what happened during that year that uh, Sedimus was with, uh, was under US protective custody uh, and met with Truman and his officials? Right. Uh, the document claims that uh, I think March 25th, 1948, they found this crashed disc and took the bodies back to, um, I believe it was uh, the uh, Los Alamos National Labs, a natural place not that far from Aztec, New Mexico, and all of the atomic bomb testing and military bases in the area. Well, uh, this one human being, adult or quasi-human being from another world, uh, was awakened and uh, kept healthy and communicative. And he began to talk. And he says, as long as I don't give you any information that will uh, apparently be weaponized or cause the future of your world to be changed dramatically, I will uh, share some things with you. And uh, after one point, they decided to move him from burning hot New Mexico, although indoors in an air conditioned lab, to a strange side, I, I read this in the document, and at first I thought, what? They moved him to uh, an intelligence uh, site or uh, army intelligence base or cabin in the woods in rural Vermont. And I'm thinking, what? The creature or the, the alien talks about his fondness and appreciation for nature and trees and how important they are to planet Earth, and they are. We're waking up to that at last. But who used to go out to rural Vermont and go hunting and fishing and maybe golfing away from his family? Uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And they even have a, an Eisenhower fish hatchery in a hotel room and a couple other things, I think, named after him to this day because he liked to go tramping about in the woods in rural Vermont, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, in my research, by the way, maybe a coincidence that uh, Vermont has some of the most UFO sightings recorded and reported in the United States. For some reason, if you want to see a disc, that might be a good place. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a link between Sedimus being taken to rural Vermont and alien uh, looking discs or UFOs uh, or not, 
All I know is that he was there for a few months and then they flew him back to New Mexico and he was returned to his own people outside an Air Force base. Uh, I think it was Kirtland. Uh, and uh, apparently they landed and took him aboard and he left. But uh, it was all very friendly and he was granted diplomatic status according to the documents uh, that um, were uh, leaked in 2017, these 1989 briefing documents. It's a remarkable tale. Uh, I'll point out two things. First, I've never seen a UFO. I have no idea uh, how I would react if I did see one. Uh, so I'm not a UFO fanatic. I don't have all kinds of wild tales to tell you. I just do research and write books. Uh, second, um, if an uh, alien being landed or uh, was here and was taken back to his people, could this have had an impact on President Eisenhower? It, did they develop a relationship? In 47 and 48 and 49, Eisenhower worked for President Truman. He also went to uh, Columbia University in New York City, where he was the uh, president of the uh, esteemed Columbia University. But he took a lot of time off, including the summer of 48. And there, I looked through biographies, and biographers are not sure where he went. And so this is the point where I think there was more intensive uh, interaction and communication with Sedimus, the human-like alien, in rural Vermont, not that far from New York City. Uh, the pieces hold together, although we don't have uh, photographs or film of the two together, but it does mention that the first one to uh, first president to go in and speak with a being from another world was actually Harry Truman, that uh, they felt Sedimus was so friendly and so trustworthy that I, uh, Truman decided to go and see him. And uh, this obviously was before uh, President uh, Eisenhower's time in office when he was just a, a general. Uh, highly thought of, of course, and he was uh, able to access all army intelligence files, the most trusted man in the country. If he did not know about the Aztec crash and Sedimus the alien, I'd be totally shocked. I think he had a big hand in how they handled him, probably under presidential orders. Well, I think this uh, story about uh, Eisenhower and Truman being part of this diplomacy with uh, extraterrestrials back in 1948-49 really is uh, such a big issue that isn't really addressed by um, you know, the UFO research community uh, because that's the thing that really got me involved because my actual background was uh, I was working at a university on citizen diplomacy and trying to promote uh, diplomacy between uh, groups in a in international conflict so that was my specialty so when i heard back in 2003 that uh, diplomacy was happening involving extraterrestrials that, that really hooked me and it actually uh, led to me being interviewed by peter Coulson uh, from the washington post where he did a story in february um, of um, 2004 which was the 50th anniversary of uh, President Eisenhower allegedly having this meeting at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And the story that Carlson addressed was one uh, that, was, that was focused on that night that uh, Eisenhower went missing when he supposedly went to have emergency dental treatment. Uh, but what whistleblowers have said is that Eisenhower actually went to Edwards Air Force Base and had this encounter with extraterrestrials. So you've kind of laid the foundation or the relationship Eisenhower had with uh, Sedimus and the ETs that began from at least 1948. So in 54, six years later, I mean, now he's having full-blown diplomatic meetings with uh, probably the same group of extraterrestrials. And of course, a lot of people are skeptical about this, but you know, the one concrete fact that can't be denied is that on that evening of February 1920, of, of 1954, um, President Eisenhower went missing for a night and they were trying to explain what happened. And that apparently was when the diplomacy happened. So you know, what do you want to say about this missing night that Eisenhower had and the likelihood that that was a cover story for him going to Edwards Air Force Space where he did have this right. meeting? Yeah, I'll preface my remarks real quick by uh, saying that there's some documents from 1942, 43, 44 from President Roosevelt talking about how we need to jump on this uh, 
the celestial devices that we have recovered with a non-terrestrial science and technology committee, uh, these wonders that have come to us from another world. So he's referring to the Cape Girardeau crash recovery and how we can uh, leap on this and take advantage and get a leg up on our political enemies. And I think uh, as uh, Truman went along and the Sedimus case, it was another case of we got to take advantage of this and establish good diplomatic relations and get a leg up on our opponents in the Cold War. We don't want to be outfoxed by uh, the Russians, uh, the Koreans, the Chinese, et cetera, uh, or even you know, our allies in Britain and France. We should establish good relations and you know, treat Sedimus very well, this uh, talking, uh, friendly being. Now, he left this world, our world, supposedly, in August of 1949. Eisenhower ran for the highest office in the land, and he won. And within a year, he went to uh, Palm Springs. And when I first heard this story, I thought, oh, by coincidence, he was golfing in Palm Springs when uh, aliens landed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base not too far away. How handy. But let's face it, if that happened today, it would have been a great fear of the unknown. If you hadn't prearranged this, aliens just came down in five different ships at a nearby air base and demanded to speak to the president, you probably would have reacted with fear. And out of caution, you would have hustled the president to board the Air Force One and gotten him out of there. But that's not what happened in 54, because I'm feeling pretty certain that was a prearranged visit Eisenhower flew 2,700 miles across the country to Palm Springs to play golf for a few days. He normally played golf at Burning Tree Golf Course in Washington, or he went uh, down the coast a little to the Masters Golf Tournament uh, or the golf course where they play the famous tournament uh, in uh, Augusta, Georgia. So there was the factor that he played there dozens of times. It was his favorite course. And they built a special home for him on the course. Why did he have to fly 2,700 miles to Palm Springs? That was the pretext to get him in the area that uh, in a prearranged meeting with extraterrestrial communication going on in the first year of the Eisenhower administration, to set up this meeting at a remote air base in the desert where no one, no civilians could see this, uh, Eisenhower was alerted that uh, on the night of, uh, I think, Friday night, February 19th, 1954, that uh, five alien ships uh, landed on an airstrip in front of a hangar at Edwards Air Force Base. They got out and spoke to some base officials in English and were friendly, and they felt uh, strongly that Eisenhower should come on out and meet them. So I'm very suspicious that Sedimus the alien that could have been communicated with in 50, or rather 1948 and 49 with Eisenhower, purely speculation, I'll admit, was part of this uh, landing committee. He was a known uh, entity, and that uh, that's why they felt it was safe that uh, Eisenhower could come out and speak to these human-like beings who were aware of our culture, aware of our language, and uh, meant us no harm. Apparently, the aliens at Edwards invited us into their airbase, or rather, into their airships, and said, "You want to come in and take a tour, or even go for a ride?" And they were obviously unarmed, no uh, offensive weapons. So uh, Eisenhower went to the meeting. He was a very strong, courageous military man, and he was not afraid. Although, I admit, uh, part of the story, he is uh, keeping a circle of six men around him. And they invited at least one Air Force test pilot to the meeting to assess uh, the technology of the uh, landed airships from another world. And that test pilot spoke out later, thank goodness, uh, in the early 1980s. So I think there could be a tie between the Sedimus story in 1948 and how Eisenhower met with these beings uh, on a Friday night. Uh, we think of it uh, previously as uh, uh, Saturday night, the 20th, but I don't think that's accurate. I thought it was going into the story that Eisenhower used a dental emergency as his excuse to go out to Edwards Air Force Base. But let's be honest, a president doesn't need to make up a dental excuse. He could just tell people at his vacation site, I have a little presidential business to attend to. I'll be back in a few hours. You guys just go about your business. 
he didn't need to make up a trip to the dentist. I talked to a woman who uh, had a friend who was at the uh, big dinner on Saturday night, the night after the alien encounter. Eisenhower was chewing on a duck leg, bit into some buckshot, some metal uh, bullet fragments, if you want to call it that, and cracked the crown off of uh, a tooth, and he was in real discomfort. So they called up the dentist. Uh, the host of the dinner had a dentist, and he answered the phone and said, yeah, sure, the president needs me, and he went to sleep. He didn't believe a word of it, and they took Eisenhower, meanwhile, to that dentist's office in Palm Springs, and they kept waiting and waiting, and they called back to the uh, host uh, uh, house in Palm Springs and said, where is this dentist you notified? And they said, oh, we're sorry, we'll call him back, and the, the dentist was uh, contacted, Dr. Francis A. Purcell, and he was finally convinced this is not a joke or a hoax. The president really needs your help. Get over to your office now. So it did take a few hours where he disappeared from view from the press. But he really did have a dental emergency. I think he went home afterwards, Saturday night or early Sunday morning. It was the night before the 19th. And uh, this is where uh, in our records, uh, presidential records, a year later, it, I, I took note of a very strange a uh, little passage uh, in February of 55. It said, uh, we uh, were in Aug uh, Augusta, Georgia, and the president wanted to meet with six, uh, well, uh, meet with a small group of Georgia state troopers who helped provide security on his Palm Springs trip in 1954. What? Georgia state troopers were flown in special. Well, these troopers were very well known to Eisenhower on all of his many golf trips to Augusta. They guarded him from the uh, the general public, he was so popular, people would show up in, in sometimes uh, groups or masses just to see the famous American general. And he needed state highway patrol troopers to guard him. And so they were flown all the way out to Palm Springs. And what was the date for this? February 19th, 1954. He needed special security. So we know from the test pilot story, there was a group of six trusted men around Eisenhower. And from his own records, Georgia state troopers were flown in special for some sort of event on that very day or night. Uh, so I think we can make a logical assumption that uh, some Georgia state troopers were around him, his friends, he trusted them, and they kept a protective circle probably with one or two secret service agents as well. And in the 1980s, in the early 80s, uh, the test pilot stepped forward and said, all of the men now from that encounter on the airbase uh, runway in front of a hangar in 54 were dead. And he said, I'm the last one left alive. I'm going to speak up about this story. I don't want the story to die out. So he told what happened of the encounter between the uh, friendly human-like beings and President Eisenhower. And thank goodness he did. Uh, it's quite an amazing tale as you can read in the book with as much detail as I can provide. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so that's very, very interesting. So you, you, you think Eisenhower did actually have emergency dental dental work, right? Uh, if, even though you know some believe that that was a cover, but but uh, that's yeah, it's, it's certainly a very interesting uh, event that happened around the time uh, Eisenhower did have this encounter. So you know, we go to the to the actual meeting itself, and the first source as I recall, discussing this was uh, this researcher from Borderland Science, Mead Lane, and he published a letter from a, metaphys a metaphysical teacher, uh, Gerald Light, about he, Gerald's firsthand account of what happened at that meeting. So can you kind of explain what was it in Gerald Light's letter that was so significant? And, and, and he, was this, in fact, the, the very first time that the public learned about this Eisenhower extraterrestrial encounter? Uh, possibly. Uh, Gerald Light was a paranormal researcher. He was very much into mysticism. He lived in Los Angeles, and he was invited to give his expert, pardon me, expert opinion on some extraterrestrials that were at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. But this was early April of 1954. And as soon as he got home, he typed up this one page letter full of uh, some interesting detail and mailed it to his friend in San Diego who ran the Borderland Science uh, Research Lab, 
that Gerald was so very fond of. Uh, the, the man who ran it was uh, Newton Mead Lane. And uh, decades later, this letter uh, leaked out and it's quite fascinating, it was uh, typed up and you could tell the excitement within this uh, author of the letter, uh, how he saw uh, five alien craft, three elon or three circular, two elongated, and some friendly human-like beings that were interacting with air base officials. But uh, I got the impression from the letter that this was like a month and a half after the Eisenhower encounter. So I think they came back for a second landing. And uh, it was kept hushed, of course, but they wanted to get uh, the reaction of people from uh, the media and from government and religion. So he went with three men. One of them was the Archbishop of uh, the American West Coast. Um, Francis McIntyre. Right, Francis McIntyre. And, and two other men that used to be associated with uh, government, including President Truman's uh, economic advisor. And they all traveled in the same car. He said, we went through hours and hours of background questioning us uh, before we were allowed to enter this air base. And while they were there and uh, viewing uh, scientists and air base officials interacting with these friendly uh, beings from another world, he learned President Eisenhower was here during his vacation in February and met with him. <coughs> and that possibly there's going to be an announcement. An official announcement is being planned for the middle of May. Uh, and obviously that announcement did not occur. But uh, the whole letter is fascinating. I certainly included every part of it and tried to uh, extrapolate a little bit about what the uh, implications were. Uh, again, hard proof is lacking. But it, the story holds together pretty well. It seems to show that Eisenhower really was there and uh, thought uh, these were pretty friendly beings. But he felt that our world just wasn't ready for this. And the general public could not be trusted. Uh, there was a mindset in the 1940s and 50s of a, a panic and social disorder of people running into the streets with guns or going crazy all from a 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast by uh, Orson Welles, uh, in which uh, people thought, listening to the radio, that aliens really were uh, landing in New Jersey and ready to fire on Americans, and we could be at war. And they listened to this fictional made-up story on the radio and thought it was true. A small number of people had uh, panic attacks, and one man had a heart attack in 38. And this was publicized blown up in the press afterwards, how people in America were so foolish and gullible and uh, panicked. Well, this had to have been the mindset of Presidents uh, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, maybe even afterwards, that, boy, we can't release this fact uh, to the public that alien beings are here and that uh, some of them are friendly, but maybe some are not friendly. Uh, it would cause uh, panic in the streets and people might quit their jobs, their schools, their education or their Christian faith and want to follow all the teachings of our alien visitors, or even treat them as gods, or even react opposite, that they're somehow demons and here, they're here to attack us. It would just be chaos. The stock market would crash. We would be in another economic depression. Nobody wanted that. So there's yet another factor for keeping this all secret. Now, in terms of tracing the origins of the Eisenhower meeting, ETs at Edwards Air Force Base story. Uh, there's another source, and this is something you actually covered in the book in terms of Richard Dolan's research, where uh, Frank Edwards, who was a radio, famous radio journalist at the time, kind of like the Art Bell of the time, I guess George Norrie now, uh, who actually first began talking about uh, Eisenhower meeting with extraterrestrials at a base. And what was interesting was that uh, Edwards was uh, sacked from his radio position not long after making that announcement. So, uh, yeah, was that really the, the first case? Because I don't know what, what came first. Was it Frank Edwards uh, giving the story, so, you know, citing his information that uh, uh, Eisenhower met with the extraterrestrials? Or, or did he get a copy of, Mead Lane, of, of the letter Mead Lane got from... Um, about the Edwards Air Force Base meeting from Gerald Light. 
I'll admit I don't know Frank Edwards' sources, but it is true that he evidently did talk about these rumors. He normally would talk about UFO stories on the air. A lot of reporters would not. They were conservative or they felt it damaged their credibility. But Frank Edwards was a very famous mutual broadcasting system, MBS reporter. He had uh, like uh, over a million listeners, maybe far more than that. Uh, in those days, in 54, people did listen to a lot of radio. Not everyone had a TV, and there wasn't much on when you did have a television. So you listened to the radio, and Frank Edwards had a huge following. So he had base officials, and the aliens were human-like and friendly, and they interacted. And I kind of wonder, um, Mr. Spielberg got uh, real-life UFO stories for his movie from the likes of Dr. Jacques Vallée, UFO author, and from Dr. Alan Hynek. J. Allen Hynek, who was part of Project Blue Book for a while, uh, the government UFO research team. And Hynek says in an article from the early 1980s, he was quite aware of the Eisenhower encounter. So I wonder if Hynek was amongst those that filled in Spielberg on this amazing story. And uh, Close Encounters featured a lot of this without an actual president being involved. Uh, but I'm uh, kind of divulging or diverting from the, the original uh, 54 story, so you'll have to steer me back to uh, where we are. Maybe we could talk about um, what that uh, test pilot said that they talked about. Sure, sure. So, yeah, so just, um, you know, that's important to kind of emphasize that, you know, the stories of Eisenhower meeting with an extraterrestrial delegation at Edwards Air Force Base in 1954 go back to that era that people like Frank Edwards, uh, the radio host, and of course, Mead Lane, the physical researcher, were, were all talking about it back in that time. And one of the people that I got to work with uh, pretty closely over the last few years of his life was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. I don't know if you ever got to uh, talk with him. He was a, a really uh, wonderful researcher, probably uh, in my view, one of the most uh, underrated, but certainly one of the most important UFO researchers going back to that era. And uh, one of the things that he told me was that he said that uh, he, re he remembers that uh, Edwards Air Force Base at, at that period, uh, February 19 of 9 1954, that they, it was placed on lockdown for three days. And, and I looked, I tried to verify it. I mean, I looked around, I couldn't verify, but that, but he was quite clear that, yeah, it was on lockdown and everyone in the military knew that you could not enter or leave Edwards Air Force Base for a three-day period on that day around that time that the extraterrestrials landed. I think that was part of the uh, Valor magazine story, that uh, there was a lockdown and uh, anyone who was not on the airbase, if you were out on leave, if you were in town, the nearest town, you were told to stay away. Uh, you were not allowed back in for three days. Uh, what possible reason they could have for this? Uh, it could be one rumor, it's purely a rumor, an allegation uh, from one source or two sources uh, I put in my book that said the aliens left a craft behind, uh, that uh, it was lightweight and that some uh, Air Force men picked it up and lugged it around. They couldn't believe how lightweight the metal airship was and that uh, they were able to keep it and store it in an airbase hangar. So that might have been a reason why they needed three days to uh, do something with this disc to hide it from the general public. And I put a few associated stories over the, uh, the next decades of people who reported seeing uh, a shiny silver metal airship in an airbase hangar at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, like in the 50s, 60s, and maybe early 70s. So. Um, there was this uh, test flight uh, pilot, an air uh, colonel, Air Force colonel, who spoke up in the early 1980s and said, everyone who was at the meeting uh, is deceased and I'm going to tell you what happened. He said five ships did come down, three circular, two elongated, and that the aliens stepped out and invited us aboard. And I think Eisenhower probably turned down that offer, but spoke in English, knew about our culture, uh, were aghast at the way we were treating planet Earth, polluting it. And uh, they were really disturbed and worried about our atomic bomb testing program, that we were recklessly testing uh, atom bombs in the atmosphere, on the ground, underground, and under the ocean. 
and filling it with radiation and contamination. And they ask that we stop doing this. And I think that would be a pretty legitimate excuse for aliens to risk everything to come down and make open contact like this. So planet Earth's future was very much uh, in the balance the way we were in a cold war, the Russians were experimenting with their atomic bombs that they had uh, stolen the formula and created their own arsenal. And they wanted to know oh, how de destructive are these things. So it was just a, a nightmare for anyone who cared about planet earth and humanity's future. So uh, they took a risk and uh, the, I, the aliens asked Eisenhower to please stop this. And he said, I'm not going to disarm unilaterally. And he probably thought about it long and hard, decided to go ahead with the atomic testing that aliens can't tell me what to do. We, we've got a, a good grip on this. We know what we're doing. And of course, about um, eight or nine days later, the Castle Bravo explosion happened in the South Pacific and it was an economic or a, a ecological disaster. It was far worse an explosion and it contaminated, contaminated uh, fish, uh, human beings on nearby islands and uh, some Japanese fishermen that were nearby and they were badly affected by the radiation poisoning. And it was uh, something that uh, was in the press and Eisenhower took a great deal of criticism from around the world. So that uh, you can say aliens may have known this was gonna happen and tried to warn him. And it apparently did not work that Eisenhower continued this testing program. Uh, he did want to stop but he didn't want to stop unilaterally. So uh, whether aliens made contact with Russian authorities or Chinese to get them to stop their atomic bomb program and testing, I don't know. It'd be very interesting to find out someday. They might have contacted the British uh, in that period. There were a lot of uh, UFO tales and even one landing story from around um, uh, just outside London in the countryside. Uh, Lord Mountbatten's estate where someone saw a landed craft on the grounds one night and reported it. And no one could discredit the story. That would have been 54 or 55. So they might have met in person with a friendly uh, military source from British uh, uh, government and authorities. So uh, the aliens pleaded with Eisenhower and uh, they said, we'd like to start our own education program to enlighten people of planet Earth, your country and elsewhere, that you're not alone in the universe, that there are other beings and uh, that some of us are quite friendly and look like you. Uh, and Eisenhower turned him down on that. He said, I just don't think our world is ready for this. He feared what they could do walking around in public, maybe setting off a panic, uh, something like uh, from a science fiction movie being in our skies, buzzing around our aircraft, uh, frightening people. Eisenhower did what he thought was best for the American public to keep the country humming along, uh, socially, economically, business-wise, et cetera. And he decided not to rock the boat. So uh, I find the story plausible and believable. I just wish we had more facts, but it's just an amazing tale because uh, I try to put as much fact and not wildly fictionize, fictionalizing the tale in my book. And there are a number of online sources that go kind of nuts and talk about alien invasion and abduction and experimenting on humans. And Eisenhower knew all about it. I don't think uh, that stuff is uh, uh, valid. Well, you know, this uh, question of nuclear diplomacy is, is really critical when we come to uh, this uh, meeting or set of meetings that Eisenhower had with extraterrestrials um, in Berlin in 54. Now, you know, the question of whether Eisenhower turned down the extraterrestrials who said, well, you know, if you give up uh, your nuclear weapons testing program and we'll give you advanced tech and philosophy and so forth. I mean, that to me is a very... Um, very controversial one because as far as I've been able to tell from my research, Eisenhower was, was not very supportive of the nuclear weapons program. And it's an actual fact that in 1953, he proposed his Atoms for Peace initiative. And of course, in the Atoms for Peace initiative that he proposed at the United Nations, he said, well, you know, we're, we're prepared to put the entire nuclear arsenal under the control of an international civilian regulatory body. And, um, and he actually asked the Russians or the Soviet Union, uh, well, will you reciprocate? 
Now, unfortunately for the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin died that very year, earlier in that year, which uh, was, was something that uh, meant that uh, there was no real strong leadership in the Soviet Union at the time to go along with Eisenhower's initiative. So uh, the Adams for Peace initiative died uh, because the Soviets wouldn't respond. They just ignored it. But, you know, right there you have uh, Eisenhower signaling that uh, he didn't want America to go down the path of developing thermonuclear weapons and just have it all under the control of a civilian authority. And, of course, it, it didn't happen. And so the, the question is, well, would this be a case of where while Eisenhower wanted to work with ETs in um, you know, not promoting nuclear weapons, that his national security team pretty much overruled him and said, look, the Soviets aren't going to go along with this. And so because the Soviets aren't going to go along with it, we can't go along with it. So you, you've got to say no. Uh, that you... sounds right. Although Eisenhower did approve all of these testing programs, the CASEL program, and uh, I think another one in the years to come, and he greatly accelerated uh, nuclear weapon creation or production uh, from the old Truman administration and shipping them overseas to distribute them to American air bases uh, to protect uh, democratic nations. However, he did give these speeches, Adams for Peace from, to the United Nations and talked about, you know, we're willing to cooperate. Let's see if we can cut down on these. So he was kind of bipolar on this issue he would talk a good game, and I think he earnestly wanted uh, some disarmament or nuclear test ban treaty, and he didn't quite get it done, but President Kennedy managed this uh, in his uh, short term in office uh, in the years immediately after Eisenhower, and certainly Kennedy uh, phoned Eisenhower. They met at Camp David, and uh, JFK went out to Palm Springs and met in person with Eisenhower during his sh uh, short time in uh, office three times out in Palm Springs. There were some uh, high-level discussions between those two disparate men. Uh, JFK was a young uh, president full of vigor, and he was an old Navy man, and Eisenhower was a, an aging, retired Army man, and yet uh, one was a Democrat, the other was a Republican. They got along famously, and they huddled at uh, various times and exchanged uh, a lot of messages through uh, aides or seconds, and they, uh, they would talk on the phone. And so uh, it makes you wonder if there was something more than atomic weapons they were talking about, uh, quite possibly ET visitation, but that is speculation. But why would you go all the way out to Palm Springs three times and meet with Eisenhower each time uh, in private and not talk to the press about what you discussed? I'm sure there was a small uh, amount of discussion, at least a small amount, maybe more, on how to handle the Vietnam uh, conflict. Uh, but Mr. Eisenhower really did want uh, nuclear arms uh, reduced or uh, to stop the, the madness of uh, all of the uh, distribution around the world. And yet he participated in it. It's kind of a contradiction, contradiction in terms of uh, what he wanted and what actually happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question of the role of the Vatican in uh, these meetings is a very interesting one. In the letter uh, that, uh, uh, that Mead Lane uh, got uh, from, the, from Gerald Light, he talked about Francis McIntyre, the Archbishop, actually being a part of the meeting. And then there were other sources saying that uh, McIntyre immediately after the meeting boarded a plane to go brief Pope Pius about the meetings and that the plane was actually intercepted and brought down at Nevada and uh, secret, I think the Secret Service or the CIA, someone uh, debriefed the Cardinal and said, look, you, you can't tell the Pope about this. This is kind of like need to know um, and, and you're, you're an American, so you, you've got to follow the rules and don't tell them. McIntyre said, no, no, I'm a yeah. archbishop. And so why don't you tell the story? What, what do you know of that? Well, that's one tale. And again, we're lacking hard evidence and documentation, but a source at the Vatican said that uh, Bishop McIntyre, James Francis McIntyre, did fly all the way to the Vatican in Italy and told the Pope everything, even though he had been warned, don't open your trap and tell him. Uh, 
McIntyre did anyway, and that the Pope was informed. And uh, part of the story, according to this Vatican source, Christopher Barbato, I think his name is. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, that uh, the detail was given that not only was this a prearranged meeting uh, between Eisenhower and these uh, alien beings, that it was filmed, uh, that there were uh, newsreel or film type cameras uh, around in the airbase hangar set up to record the event. Uh, and that uh, supposedly one of them malfunctioned when the alien ships uh, buzzed around outside, that the, there was a clash of technology. Some of the footage was black and white and some of the footage was in color and that uh, the Vatican found out about all of this. The Pope was informed. Uh, I don't think anything uh, leaked out after that, not from the Pope himself, but uh, the Bishop felt his top responsibility was to his boss, the man of God, uh, Pope Pius. So uh, it's an interesting story. And if you've ever seen uh, The 11th Green, uh, an independent movie by um, Christopher Munch that came out. I had nothing to do with this. It's just coincidence that he made this movie uh, about Eisenhower in his retirement in Palm Springs at a golf course home on the 11th Green, reminiscing about the time he met aliens when he was in office. And that uh, the artwork shows for, the, uh, for this uh, movie recreation that there were movie cameras going at the time recording the event. And there's a man um, uh, from, uh, I forget his name, um, from, uh, he worked with Skunk Works and he, he said uh, he was a- uh, Kelly Johnson? A, uh, what's that? Kelly Johnson? Uh, no, he worked with Kelly Johnson. Uh, ben Rich. Phillips, uh, Don, is it Don Phillips? Ben he Rich? Said, yeah, uh, he said he- got oh, yes, yes. Don yeah, Don Phillips. There we go. There he said, I got to look at some uh, classified files relating to the technology we were working on. And it said Eisenhower met with extraterrestrial beings and that this was, you know, a filmed event and that uh, uh, it, it was quite real. And they may have gifted something to us or come to an agreement that allowed technology to be transferred to uh, American military people, perhaps under the uh, uh, agreement that we would not weaponize it. Well, uh, there's another source that said that th this was a filmed event, which leads you to believe that it was set up prearranged in advance to have the cameras all locked and loaded and ready to go uh, to record Eisenhower meeting with these beings. Now we could be kind of shallow and say, well, that was for political reasons. Should the uh, meeting be leaked, Eisenhower could say, yes, I'm the man who met with these friendly human beings from another world. He could use it as a, a political campaign to get reelected and say, look who chose to came, come down and, and meet with uh, the first US president. Well, that would be me. Uh, or he was there to record it in case something went wrong, that I'm sure there was the worry that these could have been a, a Trojan horse type affair where they appear to be friendly at first, and then what if they whipped out some weapons or had superpowers that we weren't aware of and uh, they were worried that something would go wrong and they wanted to record this for posterity in case the president was killed or abducted or something, but nothing like that happened at all. So uh, it would be exciting if somebody had this film footage and had their file hacked or leaked in the government and released this uh, black and white or color footage of Eisenhower uh, keeping a, a friendly distance. Supposedly he did not touch the aliens. He did not literally shake their hand, but that uh, he had a warm conversation with them, keeping a circle of men around him protectively, at least at first. And they spoke in perfect English and, and discussed uh, uh, their abilities, uh, the aliens' abilities. And one ability especially really worried Eisenhower. And that was the final straw when he saw what they could do. He said, you're gonna have to leave. You can't be landing here and showing this to people. It'll really start a panic, just a, a total mess. And when you hear about this ability, you'll probably agree with Eisenhower, he made the right choice. <laughs> that uh, story from Don Phillips is very interesting because he said that the film was actually shot using uh, the hand cranking version. They, they, they had to forego all electronic uh, film recording equipment because it wouldn't work because of the electromagnetic fields yeah. generated by the craft. So that yeah. was very interesting. But I want to just kind of bring it back to, to the connection to the Vatican. 
because I think the Vatican is 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 kind of like a under under estimated here in terms of its role when it comes to the whole UFO ET uh, problem. And uh, Cristoforo Barbato that, that you cited, I mean, he talked about his Jesuit source. He said that uh, there was an, uh, a spy agency created within the uh, Vatican called the uh, Servizio Informazione Vaticano, SID, who, whose job was to focus on the extraterrestrial issue. And, and that's very interesting. Uh, because we know that the CIA uh, created, that the CIA's uh, counterintelligence division was very heavily involved in this extraterrestrial issue and that James Jesus Angleton managed it from, I think it was 1953 right up until 1974. And, and the, the thing that makes this all very interesting is that James Angleton's in addition to being in charge of CIA counterintelligence, he also was in charge of the desk for, for the Vatican spy agency and the Israeli spy agency, not Mossad. So that shows that uh, CIA counterintelligence, uh, the, the Vatican's SIV and uh, Israel's Mossad, all three were very tightly interrelated in terms of keeping abreast of this whole extraterrestrial issue. Uh, that sounds quite interesting. I did not get into it in my book, and apparently you know more than I here. You could uh, teach me a few things. But uh, one thing that I've uh, been reading about since my book came out is some stories about a maybe 1930s uh, UFO crash in Italy and that Mussolini got a hold of this material, and I think the Pope was notified and knew all about it. And that might have set the basis for what happened in the 40s and 50s, that the, the Vatican was already aware that we are being visited. And, you know, the Vatican has poured a lot of money into at least one observatory to observe the heavens. And there's talk that the Vatican has a kind of preparation going for eventual contact someday, that they take it seriously. And so I guess some of these stories could well be true. And if so, there's a foundation for why um, the Pope needed to be informed and wanted to be informed on these matters. He was open-minded because he'd already seen the evidence that they had recorded and were stashing away somewhere uh, before World War II even. So we, we know from multiple sources that uh, Eisenhower had an encounter at Edwards Air Force Base in February of 1954. Now, in the leaked 1989 document, it talks about uh, a meeting at Holloman, sorry, at, uh, at Kirtland Air Force Base in 1954. So the question is, are we talking about a second meeting or is there a confusion um, in the document over Edwards versus Kirtland? I think there could have been a second and third meeting. According to this document, there were three meetings. One was in uh, like July of 54 at a New Mexico air base, and one again in uh, February of 55. And the late Art Campbell, a very fine UFO researcher, also from Missouri, like me, uh, and he once even spoke to Harry Truman because they knew each other from Kansas City. Uh, Art Campbell did great research on this uh, 55 meeting where uh, President Eisenhower flew to Georgia again and had some state troopers guarding him and then suddenly took off for um, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base, no, Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico when he was supposedly ill with the sniffles on his uh, pheasant hunting vacation or quail hunting vacation in Georgia. And he disappeared from view for uh, like more than half a day. And there are reports that he went to this Air Force Base and a ship came down, two ships actually, circular metallic craft, one hovered in midair the second landed on an air base, uh, airstrip, and near Air Force One, and that uh, Eisenhower apparently himself got out and, and spoke with an extraterrestrial or went inside their craft for a while and came back out. Now, that sounds pretty wild, but there was a couple of uh, sources that were uh, reporting this, <laughs> including a, uh, an electrical lineman who had uh, climbed up a, a a wooden uh, pole for doing some electrical line work. And when he saw these aircraft come uh, from another world down on the airbase, he scooted down that pole fast. He was quite worried 
like what is going on? Is this an invasion or uh, some sort of secret crap that I'm not supposed to know about? But uh, anyway, uh, Art Campbell put together a good research and I think it's valid that this uh, 54 or rather 55 meeting about one year later could have been uh, the cinching up of a, a treaty or an agreement between uh, Eisenhower and these extraterrestrial beings to keep things uh, secret, to get other creatures or beings who may be coming here to agree to not show themselves openly, to remain at a bit of a distance if you just have to be here, uh, try to be mainly discreet. And uh, in exchange, we would get some technology and bring them technology at a prearranged site, apparently out in the Nevada desert at an old Air Force base. Uh, and it's uh, just a uh, fascinating a detail also uh, that is confirmed in that uh, uh, 2017 leak 1989 DIA document for the incoming Bush administration. So uh, I find it very plausible that uh, Eisenhower felt safe, secure, that he handled this uh, as a brave man himself he might have had uh, some secret service along at the time and these Georgia state troopers that he trusted and they kept their mouth shut and went back to the Augusta, Georgia area. And uh, I don't wanna get into too much, but you know, there's this strange monument called the Georgia Guidestones out in the Georgia countryside. And it's as if it's some sort of monument to alien contact or information for uh, humans on how to conduct themselves on planet earth. And I found out to my surprise in researching this, they wanted to build it in Augusta, Georgia, where Eisenhower used to go all the time and where those Georgia state troopers were from. Uh, they couldn't find land there, so they built it out in the middle of the Georgia uh, countryside far from Augusta, like in a cow pasture. Uh, I don't wanna get into that too much, but uh, is that possibly a monument to Eisenhower's contact with aliens? I don't know, but I haven't heard a better explanation uh, it was built after uh, Eisenhower and all the individuals uh, had passed away and it's still there to this day. Uh, but uh, did Eisenhower save America from social disorder by creating a, a, an agreement that could not be ratified by Congress? Could, uh, even Don Phillips said in reading this file, this classified information on Eisenhower's encounter, he allegedly told the aliens you're so advanced, how can we stop you? I mean, you're gonna do most anything you want. You're beyond us, so you're over our heads. So they tried to adhere to an agreement and if that agreement got broken and some races were abducting uh, humans and then looking them over in unpleasant circumstances and putting them back, there wasn't much we can do about it then or maybe now. So we know now uh, from these various sources that there were three meetings that Eisenhower participated in. The, the first one at Edwards in February of 1954. Then there was a one, another one at Kirtland in the summer of 54. And then you have this third one in, in February of 1955 at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And I actually got to talk with uh, Bill Kirkland, who actually did work with Art, Art Campbell. And actually, I, I, I helped uh, Art you know, do some research on Bill Kirkland. And uh, Bill Kirkland said that he overheard uh, two Air Force pilots talking about the flying saucer landing and that the rumor was that uh, there were gray extraterrestrials inside the craft and, and, and Eisenhower went in to meet with them. And that's when, you know, the agreements were made or uh, they took a step forward. So, you know, that's kind of like being out there for a few years. But one of the things that I wanted to get your reaction to was uh, something that uh, Clark McClellan talked about. I don't know if you know Clark McClellan. He was a spacecraft uh, operator. Uh, he worked for 34 years for NASA and he got to uh, work closely with a number of uh, German scientists that were part of the Apollo program because he was part of the uh, Apollo program working on different as aspects of uh, you know, the the the, the, uh, the Apollo program and then the then the shuttle space shuttle program and Clark said that he was told by the German scientists that the craft that landed at Holloman uh, actually had Germans inside it. So your reaction to that? Uh, I've read only a little about Clark. I'm not too impressed. I'm not sure about the credibility of his information. 
But who knows, maybe he could be told something and maybe that information was valid or uh, mistaken. Uh, I don't think the Germans had much going on in the 50s as far as this kind of technology. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of that tale, but it was, uh, if I can just backtrack a bit to 54, the main reason Eisenhower turned down these advanced human-like aliens was their shocking, amazing ability to cloak themselves. According to the test pilot, uh, the beings demonstrated their ability to make themselves invisible to the human eye and then reappear. And he said Eisenhower was very uncomfortable with this. Imagine aliens teaching this to human beings. So we couldn't have that in an era of spies, saboteurs, rapists, murderers, uh, nefarious people learning this ability to cloak. And, and in recent years, we are learning, uh, according to uh, reports, uh, scientific uh, sources and military sources, we are learning to cloak uh, people and ships and such. I don't know a great deal about it, but uh, it may be something we're catching up to. It sounds like something out of Star Trek, but this ability has been uh, apparently worked on for decades. And that I wonder if some of the initial information for this stemmed from the Eisenhower alien encounter. So it would have been, again, of immense importance for Eisenhower to maintain good relations, diplomatic relations with almost any race and make sure we don't have any misunderstandings, that we have uh, maybe a leg up on the communist world and that uh, we maintain uh, good ties in the future with whoever is president. And that's why I go into uh, the actions and stories about uh, JFK, LBJ, and Nixon in the uh, last chapter in my book. Mm -hmm. So I just want to kind of like just do one follow-up question to, to the information Clark McClellan uh, shared, because that's something that I've done a bit of research on. And, and one of the things that you know, is a fact is that uh, in the 1950s, you know, around the time Clark McClellan said that you know, the, the Germans landed at uh, Holloman and, and had an encounter and an agreement was reached with Eisenhower, was that in the 1950s, you had this phenomenon and a, a number of researchers, uh, Jim Mars talked about it, was that a lot of German paperclip scientists were, were, were fast tracked in terms of getting security clearances put into senior positions in uh, various uh, official space programs, missile programs, in corporations as well. And of course, Germans ran the Apollo program. I mean, you had uh, von Braun running the Marshall Space Flight Center, which was in overall control of uh, the Apollo program. And then you had Kurt de Bus, who was in charge of the Kennedy Space Center, where the Apollo missions were launched and landed, so were, were launched from. And so, you know, it shows that there was a very strong German element to all of this and um, and so you know that that does raise the question and it's one of the things I've kind of um, uh, discussed in some of my books that the Apollo program was actually a cover for this agreement whereby uh, the US would work with the Germans in researching and uh, back engineering advanced extraterrestrial technologies that the Germans had made great advances with during the 1940s. So again, this back to, you know, was it that Eisenhower and Churchill had agreed to in 1945? What was the secret that they couldn't share? Was it just, just that we were being visited by extraterrestrials or that the Germans were so far ahead with this kind of advanced technology? Yeah, uh, that remains a question to this day. Uh... There was a German scientist, naturally his name escapes me, but he gave an interview with a national like newspaper uh, story, and it came out in like mid-54, where he said, oh, we're making great advances in the space program, and thanks to beings from another world. And that's raised some eyebrows at the time. He was uh, amazingly candid, and to this day, it's like, well, what are you talking about? And it makes more sense that um, he was referencing alien contact at Edwards Air Force Base uh, from uh, earlier in 54. Uh, I wish I could remember that German scientist's name. Uh, and of course, Werner von Braun was a very advanced uh, rocket uh, scientist and uh, was involved in the Apollo program of sending rockets into space, how much he knew about um, gravity-defying disks and advanced uh, 
alien technology, I don't know. Uh, some sources have said that he was aware of some things. Uh, again, her policies were so secretive that we only get things in dribs and drabs and it's tough to research, it's tough to nail down. Uh, but uh, certainly in, as the World War II wound down, President Truman really didn't want Nazi scientists. So the CIA went behind his back with Operation Paperclip and smuggled some in and brought them to New Mexico, uh, Los Alamos, or uh, some laboratories, Sandia uh, uh, Laboratories and other places to work on uh, uh, our most high-tech uh, weapons and aircraft that we had. And uh, uh, supposedly one of them admitted at a test detonation for an atomic bomb in the 19, early 1960s, like 62, that uh, uh, one of them was asked, uh, where did we get all this technology to complete our atomic bomb program? And he said, oh, there was a spaceship crash in the, in the Ozarks in Missouri in 1941. And so I included that in my, uh, uh, my first book, Mo 41, The Bombshell Before Roswell, which is what the Cape Girardeau crash should have been in the days when we were keeping information uh, secret from the Germans before World War II. Uh, we may have utilized German scientists afterwards for their know-how in uh, weaponizing uh, recovered alien craft technology. And it's a fascinating subject, but uh, some of it gets a little over my head and uh, you could speak more intelligently about it than I can. Okay, well, uh, one last kind of incident that I want to cover before we wrap it up is uh, Eisenhower having this meeting with uh, uh, an alien, Valiant Thor, who was a guest uh, of the Pentagon for three years. And of course, Frank Strangers was the first to talk about that. He wrote his book, Stranger in the Pentagon or Stranger at the Pentagon, and says that he got to meet with uh, Valiant Thor and, and then uh, Valiant Thor was trying to get uh, Eisenhower and world leaders to uh, make reach some agreement with um, uh, Thor and the, the Venusians, as he kind of referred to them. So what do you know of that incident and how credible is it? I don't find a great credibility in that tale. Uh, for instance, the story gives a specific date that uh, this uh, valiant Thor came down in a craft and was a human in every way or in appearance and was taken immediately to the White House for a meeting. Well, I checked the president's records. He wasn't even in the country at the time. He could not have met with an alien. And when you read more about Valiant Thor, there's all kinds of different images of different men that they claim was Valiant Thor. And they're all different from each other. And I'm, a, I'm pretty skeptical on that story. Now, could something like that possibly have occurred? and the facts got skewed or uh, rumors got uh, passed around like the game of telephone where you talk to the next person and the next person and the story changes. That could have happened, uh, but overall, I'm a, pretty dubious about uh, the original claim that Frank Sturgis uncovered. Uh, he did, uh, Frank did provide some information on the Eisenhower encounter of 54 at Edwards and felt that it was real. And that, I think he was one of the sources that said that uh, a, a craft was picked up and lugged around, uh, that it was so lightweight that uh, we may have been allowed to keep that uh, silver disc uh, to inspect at our uh, pleasure. So uh, I think that uh, Frank meant well, and he might have been on to uh, some factual aspect, but um, I don't know. Uh, I'll leave that up to others. I put it in my book. I'm a little skeptical and point out the reasons why, but uh, uh, if someone has more information, I'm uh, all ears. Well, I think your book is a very important book. It really does open up uh, this very important chapter in US history, President Eisenhower meeting with extraterrestrials. I think people that do need to uh, have references to have us uh, uh, credible sources will find in your book a lot of material that will be very compelling and will get them to open their minds I mean we're not obviously going to agree on everything uh, but I think your book lays a foundation for people being able to get a solid grasp into some of this uh, diplomatic history uh, between the Eisenhower and Truman administrations with extraterrestrials. So I strongly recommend people get uh, President Eisenhower's uh, Close Encounters. I think it's available um, at Amazon and other bookstores. Anything, uh, 
anywhere else people uh, you can advise people if they wanted to get the book? Uh, you can go directly to foundationsbooks.net or like you say, Amazon. Um, probably most uh, e-book forms are available, you know, Kindle and such. But I think you and I agree that people should buy these books and read them and keep an open mind and maybe do their own research and do their own thinking and look up uh, more information. Uh, maybe you can find out more than Michael and I ever have. Uh, people are not going to get much disclosure from the government. Uh, we uh, hear uh, recently that uh, they're probably going to classify and cover up all UAP and UFO information under this new program at the Pentagon. That's discouraging. Don't look for any official uh, uh, files to be opened or even admitted to from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It's kind of depressing. We have to do our own work. So I advise folks to, uh, uh, well, <laughs> shamelessly, to buy my book and uh, uh, on the Cape Girardeau crash and on the Eisenhower encounter. And I've got another one coming on President Nixon and what he may have known. So it's a fascinating uh, subject. And if we can cram in as much uh, sourcing and reference as I do, uh, we can take them much more seriously and uh, uh, put the story together ourselves instead of relying on the government or uh, our military uh, sources, unfortunately. But I sure thank you for uh, uh, your uh, uh, kind remarks, your endorsement of the book, and uh, I thank you for having me on the show today. Uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun. I enjoy speaking to anyone who's open-minded and intelligent and probing in this issue. Well, well thank you, Paul. I, I think uh, it'll be very helpful when your next book comes out. Uh, I, I would definitely like to do another interview on, on that book, on, on Nixon and the, the uh, uh, meeting with uh, the extraterrestrials, uh, Jackie Gleason. And, yeah. and uh, where can people contact you and, and what website do you have? I've got a website, uh, www.mo41info, mo41.info. And it's got an email address there. You can get to, in touch with me if you have something important or uh, a question. If you've got some shocking information you want to reveal, some facts. Or you can go to a number of Facebook pages I have. Um, one on the Cape Girardeau UFO crash called America's First. Uh, the uh, President Eisenhower's Close Encounter. And I sometimes receive information from people there or uh, they ask more questions. And uh, I've got one on, um, let's see, uh, Paul Blake Smith's author page on Facebook. So uh, there's a number of ways. I have a LinkedIn page. I have a Twitter page. And uh, I try to do social media and keep up. It's uh, sometimes a little beyond me. But uh, it's uh, always good to hear from informed, intelligent, open-minded people from around the world. And I have heard from some folks. I'm not the world's leading expert on anything, but I'm doing what I can. I want to uh, participate and contribute something to the conversation. And I hope uh, that you feel that, that I have. <laughs> you certainly have. So thank you very much, Paul, and uh, for doing all your fine research. So that's uh, it for this show. So thank you all for, for listening in. And don't forget to like and subscribe to XR Politics Today. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.